Welcome everybody here. I'm your Anderson County Coroner and also I uh, run MedShore Ambulance Service. And I also serve on the Board of Directors of the United Way. The United Way Board uh, has put together uh, this program uh, and I'm happy to serve as your host this evening. A while back, Carol Burdett and I were talking about the growing number of deaths that were happening in Anderson County. And uh, a lot of these relate to mental health issues. Uh, you'll hear tonight from our panelists, experts in their field, of uh, the seriousness and the problems that we're having across Anderson County. And uh, we're hoping that uh, we can get you involved in uh, getting a conversation going. We have a facilitator tonight, and uh, our facilitator is Betty Parker. Betty, would you stand up for just a minute? Betty, be <laughs> Betty began her career as a trainer in 1998 in the biotech industry and has since started her own training company, Sharper Development Solutions. As you'll hear tonight from our panel of experts in the field of mental health, this is a cr critical issue in our county. It is complicated and the action can only start by listening and learning. Tonight we are thankful that you have come to listen and learn from those who have been asked to speak, but we also want to hear from you. We would like to have input uh, and hear more from you. Our facilitator will lead us in open dialogue and uh, we're really wanting your input. It is necessary to hear what you have to say if we are going to change the stories that we're reading in the newspaper and seeing on our nightly news. We want you to leave here tonight knowing more about the issue on how to access services, how to volunteer to help those suffering from mental illness. This process will help us identify the gaps in our community and the services that are needed. At this time, I'd like to introduce our panel. Our panel is made up and as I call uh, the panelists up, would you please stand up? Kevin Hall, Director of Anderson Oconee Pickens Mental Health. Thank you, Kevin. Alan McIndry, Director of Pat B. Harris Hospital. Tony Johnson, Area Director of Mental Health America. Michelle Reedy, NAMI Representative. Our probate judge, Martha Newton. She's also the senior elected official in Anderson County. Our sheriff, Chad McBride. Repre uh, Reverend Kurt Stutler, mental health first aid trainer. And Dr. Bonassis, so we call him Dr. B. He is a psychiatrist at AnMed Health. So, uh, we'll get we'll get started with the program. Good afternoon. Um, I'm the director of Anderson Oconee Pickens uh, Mental Health Center here in Anderson, and just to give you an idea of who we are and what uh, the scope of our involvement is here in Anderson County, we have been treating persons with mental illnesses here in Anderson County for 55 years. Um, every year we deliver over 100,000 services to over 6,000 people who come in to see us um, for treatment for their mental health needs. Um, and right now we're serving 3,400 active cases and half of those are here in Anderson County. Um, and to tell you the truth, that really is just scratching the surface. Uh, of the folks who uh, need treatment uh, and even the folks who are seeking treatment. Um, we primarily work with persons who have serious and persistent mental illnesses. Uh, and that includes um, schizophrenia, major depression, the things that you usually hear about. Uh, more than half of the folks that come in to us for treatment uh, have a diagnosis of major depression as their primary diagnosis. Um, we work with adults, we work with children, uh, we serve over 300 children through our school-based services program, and we have school-based counselors in four of the five school districts in Anderson County. Um, that gives you just an idea of what we do and, and the scope of what we do. Um, 
One of the things I really wanted to get us started on, though, from my perspective as the director of the Mental Health Center, is what some of the major issues are for us in Anderson County and really throughout the state and throughout the country because our issues are not really that much different. Um, one of the things that we see with folks who come in for treatment um, is substance use involvement. At least 70% of the folks that we treat for a primary mental illness also have a co-occurring substance use issue. Um, that at times, and I think you may hear some of the other folks on the panel talk about this, that can make things difficult for treatment. It used to be that the approach was, well, you know, if somebody is, is drinking or if they're using drugs, they've got to get sober before they can come in for mental health treatment. That's not how we approach things any longer. Uh, we treat the person as they are when they come in. We treat both of their issues at the same time. Um, but that is a major issue. You heard um, Coroner Shore mention that at the beginning. That's a major issue for us here in Anderson County. Another major issue that we're seeing here, I don't know if you're aware of this, but per capita, when you look at the suicide rates, um, the three counties that we serve at the Mental Health Center, Pickens, Oconee, and Anderson are the top three counties for the highest suicide rates in the state. Uh, in fact, of the 10 counties that have the highest suicide rate, seven are in the upstate. Uh, and that relates back to the substance issue, I think, uh, in a pretty direct way. Um, one of the other areas that I think needs special attention, and we have been working on this um, through the Mental Health Center, and you, you may hear Sheriff McBride talk about this, but the number of persons who are in the jails and in detention who have mental illness and particularly those folks who may have gotten in trouble with the legal system because of their mental illness because of the symptoms of their mental illness um, they don't need to be in jail they need to be in treatment and that's something that i think we need to look as a community to focus on um, Housing is a major issue for persons with mental illness in this community and every community. Um, that is something that the Department of Mental Health across the state struggles with. Uh, for the longest time, we have relied on community care homes for housing for persons with mental illness. More and more, we have looked toward independent living options for folks. Um, and that's been a major emphasis at the Mental Health Center. We have a program that we call 7030, where through the Department of Mental Health, we finance 70%, subsidize their rental expenses, and uh, the resident pays 30% in order for them to be able to live independently. Basically, persons with mental illness want the same things as any of us do, whether we have mental illness or not. We want safe, decent and affordable housing. We want to feel like we're safe where we live. We want to be productive. We want gainful employment, competitive employment, and we want to contribute back to our communities. We want to be part of a group and have social supports. And those are the things that we've tried to emphasize more and more across the mental health system. It's not just medications, and treatment appointments. We focus on housing programs. We focus on uh, competitive employment. Uh, we have a program in Anderson County that's dedicated to putting people to work um, and not sheltered workshops. We're talking about jobs they apply for in the community like anybody else. The other thing uh, I think that's a major issue, and this is for adults, but particularly for children is trauma. And trauma is at the root of so many um, issues that we see when first persons come in for treatment. Um, childhood trauma, uh, child abuse, um, uh, poor parenting, substandard living situations. These are all things that I think should be 
at really at the top of the agenda, particularly for the children in our community. Um, the Mental Health Center has partnered with many agencies in our community. We partner with DSS, we partner with the Department of Juvenile Justice, with ANMED. We have liaisons that do go to the jails uh, at the county detention center at, and at the city jail. Work very closely with Judge Newton. I think that's really a key uh, that community partners come together and work together to approach this issue. It's not just the mental health center's responsibility, it's all of our responsibility uh, to make Anderson the best community that it can be. Those are some of the issues that I see from the mental health center standpoint as things that we as a community really need to focus in on uh, to improve the lives of the folks here in Anderson County. Thank you. Well, good evening. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Michelle Reedy, and I'm with NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And NAMI is the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization dedicated to improving the lives of those with mental illness through education, advocacy, and support. And our local uh, affiliate is NAMI AOP. We represent Anderson, Oconee, and Pickens counties. Uh, now, we cover uh, illnesses such as depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic and anxiety disorders, as well as some other mental illnesses. Uh, we, unfortunately, we don't cover autism, dementia, or Alzheimer's disease. The good news is all of the services we have are free to all of you. And we've got a handout in the back that lists some of the services that we have available. And it's also listed on our website, which is NAMIAOP.org. Um, we've got a monthly educational meeting that's open to the public. We hold that in the first Tuesday of every month in Pendleton at the First Baptist Church of Pendleton. And we have guest speakers there who um, talk about various mental health topics. And I'm happy to say that many of the panel members here have been our guest speakers uh, during the monthly meetings. Uh, before that educational meeting, at 615, we have two support groups. One is for the person that has the mental health condition, and one is for the family members. Um, you don't need to register for either the educational meeting or the support groups. Uh, we also have several educational courses that are available in the area, and these are also free, but we do ask that you register for those because we need to order the materials for the people that are going to be joining us. Uh, the first one is our signature course. It's called Family to Family, and that's for anybody who has an adult relative with a mental illness. That's a free 12-session course. And that covers pretty much any topic you can think of regarding mental illness. It covers the brain biology, the symptoms, psychiatric medications, communication skills, problem solving skills, self-care recovery, and advocacy. We also have a course called NAMI Basics for anybody who has a child or adolescent with a mental illness. And that covers the symptoms of the mental illnesses and uh, the importance of record keeping. And it also helps the parents know how to go about attending IEPs, which are the individualized educational plans for their children at the schools. Um, we also have one of our newest courses is called NAMI Homefront. And that's for families of active duty military and veterans who are living with a mental health condition. And the wonderful thing about this course is we actually teach this live. It's online, though, which is helpful for people who cannot leave the home. Uh, we had one uh, lady who attended our online class, and her husband was a double amputee from the Afghanistan war. She also had four young children, so there was no way she'd ever be able to join us for a class out in, uh, in person. But she could join us from her thus from her home uh, sitting in the front of the computer there um, and all the educational courses the uh, participants leave with a manual that has some wonderful resource information and information that will be helpful for them to use in the future one of the other things that uh, we're working on uh, that will be available in this area that we're very excited about is a clubhouse. Uh, a clubhouse has programs that help adults with mental illness uh, reintegrate into the community. Um, Gateway in Greenville is an example of the clubhouse that we have in the area that you may be familiar with. And when mental illness strikes people, oftentimes they're not able to finish school or return to work, and it's very easy for them to isolate themselves. The clubhouse gives its members uh, with mental illness the opportunity to be supported, to socialize with their peers, to volunteer at the clubhouse, and perhaps even to start or return to school or work. 
and also access effective uh, services. Um, ideally, housing will also be available with the clubhouse. So right now we've got a working group that's been trained on how to set up and start a clubhouse. And the members of the working group now are people from NAMI, uh, the United Way of Anderson County and Mental Health America. And we also have individuals from the community that are interested in learning more about uh, how to get a clubhouse in our area. Uh, our plan is to develop a very strong foundation before we open the doors to a clubhouse. And at this time, we're looking for uh, people who have an interest in seeing this become available in our area. Uh, we'd love to have anybody that's interested join our working group. We meet in Anderson once a month at the United Way. We also arrange for tours of Gateway House on the second Tuesday of the month. Uh, so you can see how a clubhouse is run. It's a very eye-opening experience to see how the members and the staff there work together. Um, one of the biggest things, of course, that we're going to need is going to be funding. Uh, we do have an account set up through the United Way, so if anybody's interested in making donations, we're able to accept those now. You would just need to specify that the money goes to the clubhouse. In the future, we're going to be looking for a location. Uh, at some point, we'll need a board of directors as well as businesses and other organizations in our community to partner with. So if this is something that you see yourself becoming involved with, we would love to have you join us in that venture and just let us know. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good evening. My name is uh, Tony Johnson. I work with Mental Health America. Um, Kevin did a great job of showing the umbrella of the needs. Um, what I'm going to focus on is kind of what Mental Health America does to help kind of meet some of the needs. Um, in our community. The first thing I want to touch on is the suicide. Uh, we have two programs that we work to address the issue. One is a, our QPR program, which is question, persuade, and refer. And that program, we do seminars to help people identify what are some of the signs and symptoms of someone who is considering suicide and then avenues they need to take in order to try to prevent that from happening. The other is our suicide prevention program. Uh, not survivors, but our SOS program, which is Survivors of Suicide. Um, and that's also a working group, and they meet once a month to the family members of someone who did commit suicide. They meet to kind of cope with the aftermath that they have to deal with. Um, also, we have a Don't Duck Mental Health program, which we use, which concentrates on children dealing with uh, anger, death, uh, being picked on, because uh, bullying is a big issue. Um, and so we're trying to address that as well. And also just having a bad day. Uh, we have all had a bad day, but we try to start early on in trying to helping people, to children deal with that to kind of help them cope, hopefully help them cope as they, as they move forward in life. Um, also work closely with our national office in policy. Um, one thing that we found, you know, one of my board members has always said, you know, there's no money, there's no mission. And that's very true. But we have to make sure policy flows in a way to where mental health services are continually being funded. Uh, the loss of funding, it, it affects everything. Even with the, the clubhouse, there's going to need to be funding for that. But it's got to come from somewhere. So uh, we do work hopefully with our national office and our state office to try to keep policy in a way that continues the funding of, of mental health services. Also housing, which is a huge issue. And we currently do have units in Anderson. But we're looking at some different avenues now to try to increase the housing in, in, in Anderson and possibly even add some services with that as well. So those are the goals that we've kind of set in place now to increase the housing because that is, <clears throat> from the chair that I sit in, probably one of the biggest issues that we have. Um, if you can't have housing, it's going to affect your mental health one way or another. Um, so those are the things that we're working on and um, look forward to working with everyone in, in the future. Good evening. My name is Kurt Stutler, and uh, I am the pastor and director at the South Main Chapel and Mercy Center. And um, as I looked out upon this uh, gathering here this evening, I see so many familiar faces, which is a good thing. Uh, but it kind of struck me at first. I thought, well, gosh, we're kind of preaching to the choir here tonight. But you know what? That's that's not a bad thing. Um, I think our goal, though, is to increase the choir. Um, and I, I want to share with you in just a moment a little bit about our, our organization, our church. But before I do that, um, I'm, I'm here tonight, I think, to represent Mental Health First Aid. Uh, and it's about increasing the choir. Um, 
through the generosity of the United Way of Anderson County and Mental Health uh, America Anderson County, uh, myself and Cynthia Perry, who is on the staff at the Anderson County Pickens Mental Health Center, got to travel to San Diego back in uh, April and be trained as trainers for a program called Mental Health First Aid. Uh, this is a nationally uh, recognized program that was first started in Australia, uh, but then uh, picked up by uh, one of the federal agencies uh, and with the goal of trying to get folks throughout the United States trained in mental health first aid. Most of us are familiar with first aid, particularly as it pertains to physical issues, uh, but the idea of mental health first aid uh, is to offer um, to persons who are developing a mental health problem or experiencing a mental health crisis, the immediate care that they need to weather that crisis or to get somewhere where they can get the help they need for that crisis. So the aims of the mental health first aid uh, are to preserve a life when a person may be in danger to themselves or others, uh, to provide help to prevent the problem from becoming more serious, uh, to promote and enhance recovery for that person and to provide comfort and support. Um, we are not training people to be therapists. It's only an eight hour course, okay? Uh, but it is to, I think, both equip folks to, to be able to know what to do when they do encounter someone in a public setting perhaps that is experiencing a crisis uh, and also to raise awareness about mental illness uh, because the more aware we are and the more educated we all are about mental health issues and how to be of help to persons who deal with those issues, uh, then I think it, it makes our community uh, a stronger place. Um, Kevin spoke to the issue of folks who deal with mental illness need uh, that support to wrap around them. And, uh, and, and there still exists, unfortunately, a lot of stigma about mental illness, and that stigma is usually the result of fear, and fear comes from lack of knowledge. Uh, so we have held our first training course back in June. Uh, we, the course is um, available to 30 people at a time. Uh, we had a full house of 30 back in June, and our next course is going to be this coming Thursday, September the 14th. We already have a full house uh, registered for that, and I hope soon we'll have several dates scheduled that uh, if you're interested in the course, you can sign up for it. Um, it is, as I said, an eight-hour course, so we ask you to dedicate a whole day. Uh, to the endeavor. You'll learn about the different types of mental illness and some basic things to do in response to persons who may be suffering with those particular kinds of mental illness or also uh, substance abuse. Um, there is a small cost for the course. We just ask you to cover the cost of uh, the manual, which you'll receive, and uh, breakfast and lunch are also included when you, you come to the training. So uh, just watch out for information about the mental health first aid trainings on the United Way's website uh, for the next one that's being, uh, the dates of the next ones being offered and you can actually register there online or drop by the United Way. Uh, the United Way is serving as, um, as the, the organization that's registering folks and, and organizing these events. Um, let me just say a word about uh, what's part central to my heart, and that is uh, the South Main Chapel and Mercy Center. And let me just say what we're doing there is n not just exclusive to us, and let me challenge you to go back to your faith community uh, to make it a more inviting, welcoming, and embracing place for persons who suffer with mental illness or addiction problems. Uh, I like to tell folks we're, we're a church and then some. We're down on South Main Street in the heart of it. Um, but we're glad to be there and we're glad to open our doors not only on Sunday but throughout the week to persons where they're receiving meals, uh, where they're receiving counseling through partnerships with places like the Anderson O'Coney Pickens Mental Health Center and in South Carolina Vogue Rehab, uh, where they're receiving nursing, su supportive nursing care uh, through work we're doing with the free clinic. Um, but more than important than all those services that they're receiving, folks are finding a place where they can belong. 
uh, where they can connect their lives with other people, people whose lives may be different from theirs, uh, and a place where they also can give back and be a part of something, and, and Kevin made reference to that. So we're at 248 South Main Street, so come visit us. Uh, we worship at 11 on Sunday, so thank you. Thank you for having this program tonight, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the commitments and the problems that the court has uh, with the patients not being able to uh, find housing once they are, are ready to be released from the hospital. But I wanted to start off with the procedures for the commitment uh, process. Uh, if you have a family member that is uh, a danger to themselves or others, uh, instead of coming to the court to get a, a detention order, we direct them to the mental health center. And when they go to the mental health center and uh, talk to someone, a counselor, and that person decides whether or not they need to be committed. If they need to be committed, they will uh, fill out the paperwork and send them to the court for a pickup order. But from time to time, there's a patient out there that is really, they really need mental health treatment, but they're not a danger to themselves or others. And we do what we call a judicial commitment. And the person stays in the home until we hold a hearing. And the hearing is usually within 15 days. And we have two uh, designated examiners. One is a doctor to evaluate those. And then we hold the hearing. We appoint an attorney to represent them. And if they are in need of treatment, we will order them into a, a, a mental health facility. Uh, such as Harris Hospital or uh, maybe Bryan Hospital in Columbia. And a lot of the patients, just what uh, Doyle was telling us, oh, <laughs> uh, the director, I'll call him the director, <laughs> was telling us, Eric's his name, and uh, they are duly diagnosed. And so, most of the time, the ones that we have are sent to Morris Village in Columbia, but there's a waiting list there. We have had three, up to three months waiting list to get a patient in Morris Village, and they have a 28-day program there. If the person is participating and doing well in the program and wants to stay longer, longer they will keep them. And, uh, and then they'll come back to outpatient treatment. And in the event that they don't follow through with their outpatient treatment, uh, the mental health or the drug and alcohol facility will notify the court. And most of the time, I will issue a detention order to have them picked up because they need to get back on their medication, go back to the mental health center, or either to the Drug and Alcohol Commission. And, but the ones that are a danger to themselves are committed to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to a local hospital. In the past couple of years, I believe it's been, the uh, ANMED has started uh, admitting patients to uh, the eighth floor. And we go there on Tuesdays and hold hearings for those patients. Uh, and there are a lot of private facilities that will accept patients. But if there are no funding, uh, the private, a lot of the private facilities won't accept them. So some of them have to stay in the emergency room and be put on a waiting list to go to a state facility. And once they are committed to the state facility, we have the same procedure as the judicial. We have two designated examiners to uh, examine them and we appoint an attorney to represent them. We hold a hearing 
and we either commit them to the facility or we dismiss them or we can even order outpatient treatment through the local mental health center and the mental health center is good to keep us informed of who's coming and who's not usually the people will get to feeling better and they'll think they're well and they'll just take quit taking their medication and of course we're all guilty of that too because if the doctor gives us a a dose or a prescription for an antibiotic and he says now you take it all and we get to feeling better and we just drop it off and so that's the way the mental patients are and uh, we have to recommit them either to the hospital or to order them to the mental health center if we catch them in time uh, the mental health center can stop them from having an emergency admission by getting them started back on their medication. And uh, let's see. we have uh, a lot of patients that are committed to a lot of these outpatient uh, private facilities. And I go to Aiken every Wednesday to hold mental health hearing at the Aurora Center there, where it's a private facility, but and they do treatment for drug and alcohol. And they take some Medicaid and Medicare patients. Uh, they're limited to what they can take, but they go from the whole state of South Carolina. And they uh, are committed there just like they are for Harris Hospital or any other, or and Med. And, but a lot of the problems that we have are the family gets tired of dealing with these people because they've dealt with them so long. They don't comply with outpatient treatment. They don't comply with taking their medication. And they're just a continuous uh, commitment. Uh, every so often they're just recommitted to the facility and the hospital the family members tell us the hospital we can't take them any longer and they have to hold them there until a bed is available and sometimes it's two or three or four weeks before they can find a suitable placement for them because they can't just release them to the street and uh, we have uh, patients at Harris Hospital that have been there for a long, long, long time. And they are there because they don't have a, a place to go. They're either too sick to live on their own or they are, uh, uh, don't have a place to go. And a lot of them has an opportunity to leave but they just refuse to leave because they don't want to go out of this area. They have facilities all over the states that they can find placement for, but they won't leave because they want to stay close to home. And I can understand that too. But most of them that are there, their family doesn't visit and uh, you know they're just there at the mercy of the hospital. And uh, we work closely with the mental health center to see that uh, all of the commitments are carried out like they should be and, uh, and that the patients continue with their outpatient treatment. I think that's about all. <laughs> Good evening. I'm struggling with sinuses, so bear with me. It's that time of year, I guess, with the weather change. Uh, we, we, of course, at the Sheriff's Office, uh, come in contact with folks from time to time, usually on a, uh, and, and very often basis, I would say, with folks that uh, have mental health issues or uh, especially substance abuse issues. And uh, especially when those two are paired, uh, a lot of times it's a very uh, deadly circumstance or a very deteriorating circumstance. 
And uh, so we deal with those quite often. We obviously have the folks that we deal with on a regular basis that we see uh, kind of like Otis and Mayberry, you know, uh, and then we have those that we, we don't know. And, uh, and I think that's what makes it incredibly hard for our profession is because just because they have mental health issues, uh, sometimes substance abuse you can tell, uh, but mental health issues, sometimes you just can't tell that they have a mental health issue. It's not like it's stamped on them somewhere. And uh, so we automatically go into a different mode of being able to how to you know, deal with that individual and sometimes when you pull up on the scene, you're having to make split second decisions because violence has already erupted. And uh, so you're trying to react uh, as safely as possible, not only for yourself, but you know, for, for other folks. And so uh, clearly for us, it's, it's, we just don't know a lot of times. And uh, now I think the, the newer generation, the younger generation of officers that are, that are coming out are better equipped. Uh, Training is a little better at the academy. We used, when I went through the academy, we had zero training on it. Uh, when I was in the army, we had zero training on it. So it's, uh, I think, cadets now and even in the military, they're starting to uh, receive a lot more training about mental health. Uh, also, uh, how to detect, um, and also how to assist someone that, that is obvious. Uh, I had a couple of statistics. My phone was shut down, and. Uh, now it's not pulling up, but I pretty much know them by heart. Uh, in 2006, there was a study, I believe it was NAMI that actually did it, uh, the study about inmates, whether in a local detention center, a uh, state prison, or a federal correctional uh, center. In 2006, it was about 64% in a local detention center uh, were folks that had mental health issues. Uh, it was about 50, a little over 50% in state prisons and about 45% in federal institutions so uh, that kind of gives you an idea and that was 11 years ago most of us don't probably have, have cars that old anymore so that's those old those are older statistics and probably it's gone up a little bit uh, Harvard University did a study in 2000 uh, 2011 uh, that suggested that 30 you know, just because and going back to substance abuse and mental health uh, issues just because they have them doesn't automatically mean they're a violent person and they break the law. Uh, but through Harvard study, was about 31% of them committed a violent act at least once a year with those two uh, two scenarios, having both those issues. Whereas, is if, if it's just someone with a mental health issue and not the substance abuse, there were only 18% likely to commit a, a violent act. So, and really, in the those statistics. Uh, just because they have those uh, abuse, substance abuse problems and mental health issues doesn't automatically make them a criminal. And, uh, but I will tell you, uh, dealing with inmates on a regular basis at our detention center, um, we know that probably at least a third, and, and of course the, the statistics you're, you got from, I believe it was NAMI in 2006, which suggests 64%, we know probably at least a third, uh, 30 percent, maybe 35 percent or somewhere like that does our folks that do have mental health issues because we know they've been diagnosed with it. Uh, so, but understandably, there's a lot more than that. Um, so it's, uh, you know, my profession, obviously, uh, we're, we're called to many different scenes, many different kinds of uh, scenarios, and again, not always are able to access or, or evaluate and determine that that person indeed, uh, substance abuse obviously is a little bit easier. I will say, and of course me and the coroner have been in communication a lot because we're obviously working together. Uh, meth has been a big deal since probably about 2000, uh, especially in Anderson County, and now we're seeing heroin again. And the combination of heroin and mental health uh, or someone that already has a substance abuse issue, it's extremely addictive. And uh, even if they're not necessarily suicidal, it's obviously uh, you know, a very deadly combination. Um, and so, you know, the drug use these days, they're, they're drugs that are just overwhelmingly warping minds and bending minds and frames of thoughts and stuff like that because there's some pretty potent stuff out there. Uh, fentanyl and everything else that we're having to uh, to combat these days. So, uh, but anyway, that just kind of gives you kind of a little bit of a snapshot. 
and I'm very curious about this. Obviously, I want to learn more. I'm still a rookie sheriff, so I have a lot to learn, and I understand that. And, uh, and I appreciate uh, certainly this type of forum so I can gather more information. We certainly are going to be looking at a new correctional facility, or not correctional, a detention facility uh, in the near future. And with the help of the coroner, we obviously want to look at, you know, what alternatives are there than just sticking people in jail? Mm -hmm. uh, if they are arrested for a drug or substance abuse related issue, uh, maybe jail's not the answer. Maybe it is uh, some uh, a treatment. Maybe it's next to the jail. I don't know. Uh, we're, we're having to go. We have to figure out the logistics of that. Obviously, if they break the law, it's uh, you know property crime, a crime against an individual. They're still that side of the. Uh, judicial process that still has to uh, move forward but uh, but I think in some cases if we could get some folks some legitimate help and jail I can tell you this if if you didn't know this already our jail is packed and, uh, and I'm sure most of you already know this you probably have heard this from me or one of the other sheriffs before but uh, our jail is rated for I think 257 beds and we're uh, probably pushing 500 on a regular basis so we have some sales and uh, if you've ever been in the military you can appreciate this if you've been in barracks before you know you may be in a barrack that's suited for 30 troops or 40 troops or something like that and that's kind of how our jail was designed back in the probably late 40s early 50s was kind of a barrack style linear style jail and uh, but literally just because there's 30 beds in there we have twice that in there if not a little bit more than that so some of our cells that are designed for 30 35 people have 70 75 people in it and uh, what makes that incredibly hard for us is we're no longer able to separate people uh, you know there's different classifications of inmates usually because of violence or maybe medical needs and stuff like that uh, when your jail is that ever crowded there is no way to separate I mean just you just don't have that option anymore so we literally have several different classifications of inmates in one cell so that's one thing you know it's not just a sheriff's office problem mm -hmm. it's you know a problem for the whole county because uh, we service a lot of munis all the municipalities all the city police departments throughout the county um, it, with it, the exception of Anderson City and even some of their prisoners come to us so uh, we service uh, them and Highway Patrol and everybody else, uh, the other law enforcement entities as well. So that'll be something I'm sure that we'll talk about more as this progresses. So thank you. Uh, my name is Alan McInery and I'm the director of Pat Harris Hospital. I apologize for being late, but I was called into a mandatory conference call from our major uh, incident command center uh, down in Columbia where we're trying to plan on what we're going to do with Irma causes us to relocate patients, so we're planning on that. So, and I was sharing with my wife earlier this morning, we lived 11 years in West Palm Beach and lived through about seven hurricanes there, and now we moved to South Carolina, and, and we're going to have a hurricane come over our house here. So the Lord has a sense of humor. Harris Hospital has been in business now about 32 years. Um, we've got four lodges that are running right now. We've got an acute a female lodge, a acute male lodge, and a, an intermediate male and, and female lodge as well. Last year we did about 450 admissions into the hospital, uh, and all of those, 100%, were involuntary commitments. Um, as I look up here and look out in the audience, I see an awful lot of friends, an awful lot of uh, collaborative uh, partnerships that we have here and one thing that I I think that that we need to celebrate in Anderson and in, in the upstate in general is we have a strong history over the last several years since I've been in the Department of Mental Health which is nine years now of collaboration because the problem is not Kevin's problem or my problem or the judge's problem or the sheriff's problem it's all of our problem because the truth is the magnitude of the issue is greater than all of our resources combined so what we determined many years ago is we come together quarterly in a meeting and we talk about issues. It could be a law enforcement issue, it could be a probate issue, it could be whatever. And we have our uh, Mental Health Americas there, NAMI's there, and we look at how can we maximize 
the limited resources we have to address the problems. How do I give you an idea of what the scope of the problem we deal with today? I, I'll give you an example that I give to the nursing students when they come through Harris Hospital. Um, I ask them how many are interested in, in mental health, and out of a class of about 40, maybe two will raise their hands. And I, and I say, okay. I say, well, the rest of you, I've got news for you. You're all going to be involved in mental health. And I give them a little history lesson. Now, they're all much younger than I. They don't remember Lyndon Baines Johnson in 1965, the Great Society. But some of you do. It was ushered in. The community of mental health movement started back then. The population of the United States was half of what it is today. But in 1965, 1968 time frame, depending on the statistics you look at, between five and 600,000 people were in state psychiatric hospitals throughout the United States. Fast forward to today. There's twice as many people. By any measure, the stress that the children and the kids and the folks are going through today is greater than when I was a kid. Father knows best. Leave it to Beaver. Spanky in our gang. That was reality for us back then. You could go out and play and not worry, not be stressed. So today the stress is greater. The population is twice. But there are only about 30,000 people in state hospitals in the United States of America. So where are the rest of them? They're wherever those nurses are going to be. They're at AnMed. They're in your family practice. They're in wherever you are, all walks of life. And so one thing that we do here in Anderson, I think, very well is we, we work together as a team a quarterly and more often as necessary to deal with the issues at hand. And I think that's something we should celebrate, and we do. We only admit patients to Anderson to uh, HPH now that have serious mental illness. And what does that mean? They're either a danger to themselves or others. They've got active psychosis, which means there are a lot of folks that aren't appropriate for us. There are a lot of folks out there that need treatment, but in our venue, it's not an appropriate place. So we're looking at folks that are generally of, of uh, uh, harm to themselves or others as a primary thing, and that they're committed uh, on, on papers to come in. Um, and our primary diagnoses are the schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, schizoaffective disorder. Um, about 70% of our patients, we're talking drug and alcohol, about 70% of our patients come in, uh, they're presenting with polysubstance abuse. We very rarely get someone who's just marijuana or just alcohol or whatever. It's going to be multiple, and the drug du jour in the upstate is meth. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, that's a, a challenge for when they come in for us because then we have to determine which came first, the psychosis or the substance abuse, because there's a big difference between psychosis that leads to substance abuse and substance abuse-induced psychosis. And that's what folks like Dr. Bamashmus, I have nothing but admiration for how they can do that because everything they do is inferential statistics, if you had that in college. They're looking at what's going on of 100 uh, billion neurons uh, inside the brain and trying to figure it all out. And we have an intensive program there. We call it ISAP, the Intensive Substance Abuse Program. And about 10 patients at any one time are involved in about a 28-day program that's run by two counselors there in substance abuse. And it's one of our stronger programs. We're organized with a, a multidiscipline treatment team concept that comes together, as are most hospitals these days, nothing new. Um, so it's not single modality, it's multiple. We've got psychiatrists, family practice docs, nurse practitioners, we've got psychologists, social workers, activity therapists, pharmacy and nursing. They all sit in on uh, uh, the treatment teams to, to, to work with the patients with individualized treatment plans. Average length of stay for our patients, if you take the outliers out, could be about 21 to 28 days for the average, except for the outliers. Um, we work with five community mental health centers in the upstate, uh, AOP being one of them. We've got Piedmont, Greenville, Spartanburg, and uh, Beckman down in Greenwood. And we work very closely with them because what we want to do is when we, when we get through stabilizing a patient baseline at Harris, we want to have an effective handoff with uh, Kevin and Eric. and. Uh, to ensure that, that we wrap appropriate services around that patient to ensure a higher probability of success when they get in the community. And when we do that well, 
we have better outcomes. When we don't do it so well, we have less than optimal outcomes, but we do it pretty well because we have very strong working relationships. What The one thing I would like to tell you about the Upstate is to, to realize is this is a system of care. It's not just Harris Hospital treating 450 patients a year or AnMed or Self or whoever. It's all of us together because the patients that, that Sarah Fox has got on 8 South today, uh, she'll be in touch with me and we, we know them and, and, and a lot of them move around in different places. Um, but the good thing to know is that, that about 60% of the patients who come in our door have never been in the South Carolina Mental Health Center before. They've not been in the system. They've not been inpatient, and a large proportion of those have never been outpatient. So what does that tell us? That all of our collaborative work, all of our coordination, all of your hard work yields results because a, lot, a large majority of the folks are able to achieve a higher quality of life and stay out in the community. So that's a good thing. Um, what else would I want to share with you? And that's about it for us. <clears throat> My name is Abdallah Bamashmas. I've been around for a long time here. <laughs> I was going to tell you how uh, psychiatry is, is in a way having a very hard time, but I decided in the last minute to change what I'm going to say. Um, I was on call last night, so I had to go to the emergency room this morning to clean up. That's what we call it. So I saw three different patients. One just got rele released from Perry Correctional. He spent there nine years. Released on Friday. By Tuesday, he was in the emergency room, psychotic like hell. Cannot be controlled. Very agitated. Very paranoid. Could be combative. Another one took the bus from Florida to Anderson and decided that he's suicidal, ended up in the emergency room. A third one, his wife could not handle him, has had four strokes, got demented because of the stroke, became irritable, agitated, combative, couldn't handle him, brought him to the emergency room. That's what we deal with day in, day out. So the system, in a way, I hate to say it, is broken any way you look at it. The reason it's broken is we categorize everything the way we want to categorize it. I've heard a lot about mental illness. To me, it's a brain disorder. These are neurons. Mental is an abstract. I cannot touch mental. I can see the brain. I can see the neurons. If we don't do anything sometime in the near future about mental health, brain disorder, psychiatry, whatever you want to call it, we are in trouble as a society. You have dementia. Nobody talks about the behavior problems with dementia that come hand in hand with the treatment that we do day in, day out. Look at the nursing homes. Look at the loved ones that you have that cannot sleep at night, that's irritable, paranoid, having visual hallucinations. That's part of psychiatry. <coughs> look at the disability and special needs board and look at the patients that they have that cannot be controlled, whether it's just autism or developmental delay or agitation or psychosis that we cannot describe, just give it a name. So we have to look at this issue seriously. If we don't, we are in trouble. The costs are going up, the shortage of psychiatrists, mental health workers, Nurses, we have difficulty in unmet to admit patients because we don't have enough nurses who want to do psychiatric work. So we have a problem. And if we don't look at it uh, at higher up with serious, serious money, uh, it won't cost more than two jets, uh, F-16, or uh, yeah, it won't cost more than that. We can do that as a society. So. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with depression, suicide, or they have covered that for me. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions later on, I'll be able to handle them. So I was going to talk about quality of care, follow-up, uh, 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 compliance. I don't think they have covered that for, for uh, and I'm not going to talk about it at this time. Thank you. All right, well, good evening. Uh, let me start by saying thank you all for coming um, to this great starting point. This is a great beginning. So we heard a lot of issues around access, housing, 
um, providers, parity, uh, advocacy, all of those are tremendous issues that are important issues, but they all start here tonight with all of you. This is a starting place. Uh, I want you to think about how much of an impact we could have as a community if we viewed mental health the same way we viewed diabetes, the same way we viewed heart disease. Because, you know, there's, there's no stigma around a diabetic, right? There's, you better watch what you eat. There's no stigma necessarily around someone that suffers from heart disease. And when we can get to a place as a community that we talk about mental health, the same way we do diabetes, the same way we do heart disease, so that there's no stigma attached to it, then we'll make huge strides. Because a big part of the issue is the fact that we don't feel comfortable talking about mental health issues. Therefore, it makes it difficult to advocate for the things that we need. And someone mentioned funding. And um, so none of the folks from mental health can say this, but I can. Um, they celebrated this year because they were able to restore their funding at the Department of Mental Health to the level they saw in 2008, roughly. And because those were tremendous financial times for our state and there were cuts to all agencies, but this is one where if you don't have advocacy, you don't have people speaking up, it makes it hard to restore the funding. And you, we had to mention the number of beds at Patrick B. Harris. That's the number of funded beds at Patrick B. Harris. If you ask about what is the actual capacity of Patrick B. Harris, that's different, right? And so it's all back to advocacy, and that all starts with you. And this is such a critical, important issue because every day there are people being impacted. Yesterday uh, morning at 8.30 a.m., we had eight mental health patients in our emergency department. The preceding 12 hours, we had seen a total of 16 mental health patients in our emergency department. And on our eighth floor, we had a census of 17 mental health patients. The primary function of AMED Health is for medical care. But as a result of, but because of the capacity issues, you see that we are dealing more and more with mental health issues. And those are just diagnosed mental health issues. If you go up on, went up on our nursing units, the different units where there was a medical condition, you would also find that our nurses and our doctors and our CNAs are also dealing with patients that, that have underlying mental health issues that they're working on. And it's easy to walk away and say, well, mental health really doesn't impact me. But I assure you, if you show up in our emergency department, it's going to impact you. If you look at what's going on at our jail, then you will see that mental health is impacting you. If you, you walk out of a retail outlet and you say, hey, that person was kind of behaving strangely, mental health is going to have an impact on you. The question is, how much stronger could we be? How much better could we address these issues if we change the way that we talk about mental health? And we look at it not as um, a failing, but simple, simply a medical condition that needs to be treated and understood and addressed like we would any other medical condition. Then we'll see significant progress around this issue. Uh, we talked a little bit about overdoses. And, and some of those issues that have under that that are results sometimes of mental health issues. Quick numbers: 2016, um, our emergency department treated 161 overdoses. 2016, we admitted 413 overdose patients. That gives you an idea of some of the issues and challenges out there. Those patients usually have to go to the intensive care too. Though. Usually, though, that's a one or two day intensive care stay. And you, you talk about funding, um, that's a huge issue. You're paying for it. We're all paying for it. But what can we do to better utilize our resources as a community to make a difference in this very important issue? So there's a lot of work to be done. I'm excited because there's a room full of people who are going to be actively engaged in this work. And the last thing I'll leave you with is that I am extremely optimistic because I know that there's a lot of work going on to address a lot of these issues. In our community, there's work going on around this idea of a mental health court so that the sheriff will have another option as opposed to incarceration when there's someone involved in a mental health issue. And our elected officials are leading the charge, Representative Thayer and our sheriff and our probate judge and, and others are leading the charge to see that that happens. 
I know that in our community, there's very strong conversations around someone mentioned, you know, someone needs just a place to detox and for short stays. There's very strong conversations going on in this community around crisis stabilization. There are very strong conversations going on in this community around what can we do to better address the issue of housing? And what are some unique approaches to housing for those with substance abuse and mental health issues that we've never really thought about? But those conversations are going on. And the only way those conversations continue at the velocity and at the level they are is that all of you get behind those work, the work that's been going on and that you tell people that you know and you tell people out in the community and, and our, our leadership that these are issues that are important. These are things that we view as important. And then we will start to see a huge difference. And uh, the last thing I'll leave you with is, for me, it's, it's a very important issue. Um, I think we all know people who have suffered from mental health issues. And I can tell you that it is across the spectrum. In the course of two days, there was someone I knew who, um, very affluent, who was struggling with a child, uh, well, an adult child that has a very severe mental health issues. That's on one end of the spectrum. By the end of that day, um, I helped coach a, a tenant on the football team, and there was a kid that was just like, whew, tough to deal with. And after I talked with the head coach, he said, you know, he's 10 years old, but he's already expressed desires to commit suicide completely different ends of the spectrum. This weekend, we had a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 15-year-old in our emergency department, right? These are real issues impacting real people that we know and love. And we owe it to them, we owe it to ourselves, and we owe it to our community to stay engaged and to get the, the work put in that we need to be successful in bringing um, this issue to the forefront and making sure that people remain engaged in it. And so, again, I will say thank you for coming and let you know that this is not the place where we stop, but this is the place where we're all going to get started working a lot more on this effort. On behalf of United Way, I want to thank Greg Shore for opening tonight and being such an advocate for the citizens of Anderson County in the areas of, in particular, mental health and addiction. I want to thank our panelists who all did a wonderful job. Betty Parker for being our facilitator this evening. Michael for your closing. I also want to thank uh, County Bank and Glenn Budden again. Thank all of you for coming out this evening. But I want to remind you before you leave that we'll be back here in two weeks and we'll be talking about addiction. We'll be back October 5th to talk about lack of conflict resolution skills and then back the last Thursday in October to talk about the proliferation of gangs. And why have we chosen those four things? We see at United Way as being the sum of the root causes of the crime and violence within our community. So please come out and join us. We look forward to having you involved in helping to find solutions for our community around these issues so we can change the story in the newspaper and on our evening news. Thank you.